Uh, so you're still on the table of contents? Yes. Hmm. Oh dear. No, Zoom has sometimes the problem with uh, the full screen mode of uh, PDF. Uh, well, uh, I can stay in this mode. Yeah. Should I just stay like that? Let me try to get. Yeah. How's that? Okay. It's okay. All right. Okay. So to start at the beginning, let's say we have a circle action on a closed manifold N. So writing the action as A, it, it takes a point on the circle and a point in the manifold and gives another point on the manifold to N. Uh, we can think of this as giving a loop of diffeomorphism. So for each theta, a point in N goes to another point in N. And it is a diffeomorphism because the inverse is the action of E to the minus I theta. So, I mean, here, here's a question. This is a very simple setup. When is this loop of diffeomorphisms non-trivial in, in the fundamental group of the diffeomorphism group? So one case we can get rid of immediately is if the action is trivial. In other words, it fixes every point for all values of theta, then, then it, uh, each diffeomorphism is the identity and the loop is trivial. Uh, the other extreme case of actions are, I guess, are free actions, where the only time a point is sent to itself is uh, when the parameter theta is zero or two pi. And of course, most circle actions fall in between, but we're just going to look at these free actions. Uh, in this case, uh, N becomes the total space of a circle bundle L over the orbit space. So the orbit space is this base M and the fiber is uh, all the points in the orbit. And the action just becomes rotation of the fibers of L. So here's a kind of uh, running example we can use. Uh, top vibration, N is uh, a sphere, a dimensional sphere inside a complex space. And the action uh, just uh, multiplies each coordinate by E to the I theta, takes the sphere to the sphere. And then the quotient space is, is by definition, CPK, and L is the circle bundle inside the canonical bundle. And through this talk, I, I won't really distinguish between circle bundles and the complex bundle that they sit inside, complex line bundle they sit inside. Okay, so we have this uh, loop of diffeomorphisms given by rotating the fiber. Well, in this case, uh, this rotation is an isometry of the big space, the sphere. And, uh, and that means the loop is an element of pi one of the isometry group of the sphere, which is uh, orthogonal group or special orthogonal group. And that fundamental group is Z2. And this action is, turns out to be the generator. Okay, uh, to give some more motivation for studying these diffeomorphism groups, uh, we can go to the setup of geometric quantization. Here you start with a symplectic manifold uh, with an integral symplectic form. That means uh, the cohomology class of omega comes from an integral cohomology class. Uh, so for example, if sigma two is a closed surface, the integral of omega over sigma two is an integer, not just a real number. And in this case, you get an associated line bundle with connection and the curvature is a multiple of omega. Uh, you can think of this if M is four dimensional as a setting for gravity, a setting of gra gravity unified with electromagnetism where gravity is taking place on the space-time manifold M and uh, electromagnetism is coded up in the line bundle. Uh, 
Oh, right. And uh, if we we need a Hilbert space to start our quantum field theory or just uh, quantum mechanics, uh, and that will be the sections of the line bundle L. Some uh, inner product. Uh, the Fox space now is the uh, algebra given by sections of tensor powers of L and taking their direct sum. So L to the P uh, being thought of as P particle states. And in this case, of course, we have this uh, rotation of the fibers, which we can think of as a, a very rigid gauge transformation. Just rotate the fibers. And, and again, I'm not gonna distinguish between the circle bundles and the line bundles. So the question, the question is, how does this circle action affect the quantization of this setup? When you, when you go to a full quantum field theory, maybe perturbative quantum field theory. And um, it's hard to say. One thing you can say is if this loop of diffeomorphisms is trivial in the fundamental group of the total space, of diffeomorphism of the total space L to the P, then uh, this action really won't play a big role in the quantization. So uh, kind of putting together these two motivations, one from circle actions, one from getting ready to do uh, quantum field theory. Here's the main theorem I wanna talk about. So let's take a symplectic manifold with its integral symplectic form. This, the manifold will have dimension 4K, not 2K in general. Uh, we get an associated line, line bundle, circle bundle L. Then for P large enough, this rotation of the fibers is an element of infinite order in pi one of the diffeomorphism group of the power of the line bundle and uh, same thing. In this case, it'll be an action by is isometry. So it'll be an element of infinite order in the isometry group by one of the isometry group. So what we can say is that when we go to do a full quantization of this theory, the possibility of uh, gauge anomalies, namely that uh, correlators in the theory could change after you do a full rotation of the fibers. So you come back to the same kind of geometric setting, but your uh, correlators could have changed. Okay, that, that's all I'll say about that. And uh, as I said, the proof will involve characteristic classes built from the Wozicki on the tangent bundle to the loop space of L uh, to the P. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what do we know about diffeomorphism groups? How do our results fit into this? So what do, what's known about diffeomorphism groups of closed manifolds? Uh, so start with the simplest manifold. Diffeomorphism group of S1 is homotopy equivalent to the isometry group of S1, which is O2. And uh, if you can prove that the fundamental group of the circle is Z, you can prove this result. It's, that, it's at that level. For surfaces, uh, again, it's true. Diffeomorphism group of S2 is, has the homotopy type of the orthogonal group. It's isometry group for this standard metric. This was proved you know, by Smale quite a while ago, and the proof is a few pages. Uh, in the 70s, there was work on the other surfaces. Uh, the identity component of the diffeomorphism group of the torus is homotopy equivalent to the torus, which is again the isometry group of the standard flat metric on the torus. Uh, components of diffeomorphism uh, of groups of uh, higher genus surfaces are contractible. In three dimensions, the same result, diffeomorphism group of S3 as homotopy group of O4. This is quite difficult paper. Uh, result of Hatcher in the 80s, things kind of move a decade at a time. 
And then for hyperbolic manifolds, these manifolds with constant negative curvature metrics, for most of them, having this technical condition of being not ciphered fiber, again, the components of the diffeomorphism group are all contractible. Uh, there's a recent uh, proof of this result by Daimler and Kleiner using Ricci flow. So it's, it's very impressive. Uh, so again, in all these cases, the diffeomorphism group has a homotopy type of the isometry group for these special metrics. Uh, Hatcher gave a survey in 2012 where he said in dimension four, nothing's known. Uh, and I mean, now a little bit is known that the diffeomorphism group of S4 does not have a homotopy type of its isometry group. As, as usual in uh, low dimensional topology, things sometimes get easier in higher dimensions. So it's known that diffeomorphism group of SN is not its homotopy equivalent to its isometry group in higher dimensions. And uh, in the so-called stable range, where N is a lot bigger than I, uh, there are results that pi I of diffeomorphism group of SN is isomorphic to pi I of the orthogonal group uh, up to a semi-direct product with a finite group. And, you know, as far as I know, that's about all that's known about the topology of the diffeomorphism group. And in particular, a kind of a test case would be pi one of the diffeomorphism group of the five sphere. Right? That doesn't fall into the stable range. I mean, what, not much is known about it. So that's a good test case. Okay, so here's a, I just restated the theorem uh, that for these symplectic manifolds with line bundles, then this rotation of the fiber is going to be an element of infinite order in pi one of the diffeomorphism group and isometry group. Uh, so let's do a couple examples. So going back to this hop vibration on projective space, uh, I mentioned that this rotation is an element of order two, certainly not infinite order. So we, this is for the line the circle bundle L itself, not its power. So we definitely need uh, to take high powers of P to get this theorem to apply. Uh, in the case of CP2, uh, uh, oh, so the symplectic form here is the Fubini Studi uh, form. So this is a, a Kähler structure. Uh, so the, the line bundle is uh, the five sphere. It, it turns out that these higher powers are quotients of the five spheres just by some ZP. So you get a, a so called lens space. And we'll see in this special case, we can do more uh, precise calculations. And pi one of the diffeomorphism group of LP is going to be infinite whenever P is not not equal to one. So in particular, if we take P equal to two, well, L squared is now RP2, and this result says pi one of diffeomorphisms of RP5, sorry, RP5 is infinite. So you can see that we, we get close to information on diffeomorphism of S5, but in fact, we get no information. So that's kind of a tricky case. Uh, and there's also non kähler examples. So we worked on example of a symplectic manifold with no kähler structure due to Kutaira and Thurston back in the 70s. And then we'll see that, again, in these cases where you can do explicit calculations, Pi one and diffeomorphism group fell to the P is infinite for all P. Okay. So I want to start talking about the proof of this theorem. I want to relate pi one of diffeomorphism groups to the loop space. So the first thing we can do is start with our manifold N. For us, it'll be this total space of high power of a circle 
Now we have the N with a S1 action. And we're going to start with a kind of equality at the level of functions, just sets. So if you have the set of functions from S1 cross N to N, like our action, I mean, that's equivalent to the set of functions from S1 to functions from N to N and a set of functions from N to functions from S1 to N. Uh, in our case, because of the action, the mappings from N to N we get are diffeomorphisms. And the maps from S1 to N is by definition the loop space, although we haven't discussed the topology yet. So our action A, which is, uh, which is uh, on the left-hand side of that function equality uh, corresponds to uh, this loop of diffeomorphisms, which I'll call AD. And it corresponds to something on the right-hand side, which I'll call AL. So AL is a map from N to the loop space. And, and what it does is it takes a point on N to its orbit under the action. So these three maps are entirely equivalent. Uh, So let's say N has dimension 4K plus one. So uh, that'll happen if the, you know, the base manifold M has dimension 4K, then AL induces a push forward on top homology. And we'll set square brackets AL to be the push forward of the fundamental class of N. So that's a homology class on LN. Uh, and I'm assuming N is oriented. Okay, so an action gives us a kind of preferred homology class. And because uh, these A and AD and AL are equivalent to each other, it's not surprising that there's some topological uh, correspondence between them. So the lemma is that this loop of diffeomorphisms has infinite order in pi one of the diffeomorphism group of N, that's what we're interested in if and only if this class AL in the homology of LN is non-trivial. Is non That's the main content of the lemma and it's easy to prove. And uh, how do you prove this element in homology as infinite order? Uh, I mean, one way to do it is to find a closed 4K plus one form on the loop space, integrate it over this class and get something non-zero. Okay, so this is why we're interested in finding uh, interesting differential forms or interesting Durham cohomology classes on the loop space. Okay, I just restated the lemma here just because I'm on a new page. So how are we gonna find this form? So could it be a characteristic form? You know, could we have some connection on the tangent bundle to the loop space and take its trace? Uh, the answer is, is no, definitely not, because you know these uh, churn forms or churn classes have even degree and we need an odd degree form. Well, could it be some sort of churn Simons form, a secondary characteristic form? Because these are odd degree classes. Uh, and I'll, I'll just kind of list the obstacles to constructing such forms. So, you know, the loop space is infinite dimensional manifold. As we'll discuss, tangent bundle will be infinite dimensional. A curvature of any connection is a two form on the loop space with values in homomorphisms of this infinite dimensional space, TLN. Uh, so, Omega takes values in linear operators on the fiber. I mean, in this generality, what does, what does trace mean? I mean, the first guess is operator trace, but there's this class a priori. Same thing with Dixmere trace, misspelled. Uh, and, you know, these sorts of traces, even if they exist, you're not going to be able to compute with them. 
and uh, you know the power of Chernvay theory is the ability to do computations. I would say. So what will happen is, in our case, the operators we get on the tangent bundle will be uh, pseudo differential operators, strictly speaking, acting on sections of the tangent bundle, and the trace will will use will be the Wozniki residue. So that's where I'm going. Okay, on to discussion of geometry and topology of the loop space. So we start with an oriented closed Ramanian manifold for us. But what, what does the tangent space to the loop space look like at a loop gamma or a point of LN? And uh, it's kind of well known that uh, this tangent space is a set of vector fields along gamma. So I want to explain what that means. And uh, you may know this very well, but it took me a long time to draw this picture. So I'm going to show it. So here's a loop gamma on my manifold N. And, you know, how do you find a tangent vector to a point on a manifold? You take a nice curve through that point, and you take the uh, infinitesimal information, the tangent vector to that curve, just informally speaking. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll take a curve of loops, so some gamma sub s, where gamma is the time zero loop, gamma zero. And then at a fixed parameter theta naught, we get an ordinary curve on N given by gamma sub S of theta naught. And the infinitesimal information is that tangent vector on the manifold gamma S dot at theta naught. And of course there's infinitesimal information at every point of the loop. You get a tangent vector on the manifold at each point of the loop. So you might say, okay, so I get just, it's like a vector field on N, but it's just restricted to the loop. Uh, but strictly speaking, that isn't correct because at self intersections, you could definitely get two different tangent vectors. So you don't get a well-defined vector field from N's point of view but it's easy to separate out the different times. And the technical way to do it is to take the tangent bundle of N, pull it back, back by gamma. So we take gamma star TN as a bundle over theta space, bundle over the circle. So really what we're getting is a section of gamma star TN. And uh, if N is orientable, this bundle over the circle is, is trivial. So really we're just looking at sections of a trivial N bundle over S1. And I mean, the, you know, so uh, the tangent space at gamma is really functions from S1 to Rn. You can put your favorite topology on this pretty simple function space, a, a, a Banach space topology, Sola space topology, or uh, take it into Frechet topology. And with a little bit of work, this topology on the tangent space gives you a topology on the loop space itself. So uh, structure of an infinite dimensional manifold on LN. And uh, just as a remark for, uh, I'll use in a few more slides, you know, if you take an ordinary manifold, then the structure group of the tangent bundle is uh, the general linear group. I'm just saying that the transition maps for this bundle lie in GLNR in general. Uh, and you can check that the tangent bundle, a uh, structure group of the tangent bundle is just the infant dimensional analog, it's maps from S1 to GLNR. So that is in fact the gauge group 
of the uh, tangent space thought of as this trivial bundle. Okay, so we can understand the structure group. It's a gauge group. It's not too bad. It's infinite dimensional, but not too bad. So that was a, a quick discussion of the topology of the loop space. Uh, now I want to talk about the uh, geometry of the loop space. So let's fix a loop, gamma. And uh, as, as I just said, a tangent vector is a section of this trivial bundle. And to make it precise, it takes a point on the circle theta and takes it to exo theta, which is a tangent vector on N at the point gamma theta on the loop. So if I want to put a Ramanian metric on this tangent space, I have to define a, an inner product. Uh, there's a very natural way to do this. We, we just take a Ramanian metric on N and then we get a L2 type inner product on the loop space on this tangent space by taking two such uh, tangent vectors, uh, taking their inner product of each point theta on the circle and averaging that over the circle. Uh, so that's that's quite uh, quite natural. Uh, it's not a very strong inner product just because L two is not a very strong uh, strong norm on a function space. I mean, you know, having functions converge, sequence of functions converge in L two is nothing like having pointwise convergence. Doesn't even make sense. So it's a weak inner product. And if you want a stronger inner product, in particular, to have something like convergence of you know, functions implies pointwise convergence. Uh, you have to go to uh, some higher Sobolev norms. So let's pick a, a uh, positive number S. Let's take it to be a positive integer for the moment. So we can take the S inner product by uh, operating on the uh, vector field X by some power of a Laplacian-like operator. So here to form uh, the Laplacian, we take covariant differentiation along the loop and compose it with its adjoint. And uh, remember covariant differentiation is we're, we're just differentiating X along the loop in local coordinates, but then that's a first order operator, but then we add a zeroth order term that makes it independent of coordinates. That's how we think of covariant derivative. So for any choice of S, now uh, the loop space becomes a Ramanian manifold and uh, all these Sobolev spaces are Hilbert spaces. So we're in a kind of tighter setting, not in a Banach or Frechet setting, but in a Hilbert space setting. We have more control. And for S high enough convergence of vector fields and the S norm implies pointwise convergence. Uh, the choice of S is not natural, but we think of it as some sort of regularization parameter that we don't like very much. And any meaningful results uh, we get should be independent of S. And, and that will be the case. You won't really see it in this talk. It's kind of uh, in the technicalities. Okay. Well, now that we have a Ramanian metric, we should have a Levitch-Evita connection. Remember, we want to do a type of chern vey theory. So this is the direction we should be going in, connections and curvatures. So what is the Levitch-Evita connection associated to this S Ramanian metric? Well, in the box, I wrote down the standard way you define a Levitch-Evita connection from a Ramanian metric in a coordinate free way. We really don't wanna be working in coordinates on the loop space. So what I've got here is three tangent vectors or vector fields, X, Y, and Z. And on the right-hand side, I mean, the first term, I take the inner product uh, at each point and see how it's changing in the X direction. And the last three terms involve Lie derivatives. 
And what, what, how, how does this formula work? You look at the right-hand side and you see that uh, the individual terms may or may not be linear in Z, but the non-linearities all cancel out. So the right-hand side is linear in Z. And if we're in finite dimensions, the right-hand side is now a linear functional on Z. So it's given by the inner product of something with Z, and that's the left-hand side. That something is by definition, the covariant derivative of X direction. So we can try to take this over to infinite dimensions. And the only thing we realize, have to realize is that the right-hand side has to be continuous linear functional Z. Remember, we're in a Hilbert space structure now. So if the right-hand side's continuous linear functional Z, then it's given by inner product with something that we'll call the covariant derivative. So there's one more step to check in infinite dimensions. But I mean, it does work for these Sobolev space metrics. So let's look at this L2 case or where S is equal to zero. Uh, in this case, levi civita connection is just built very directly from the levi civita connection on the manifold itself for the metric I'll call G bar. Namely on the first line, you see that this inner product defining the levi civita connection is given by integrating the the same inner product pointwise on the loop. So it's very simple. And uh, as I said below, uh, as I said uh, on the last slide, I'm gonna write the connection as first, just in local coordinates, differentiating y in the direction of x, and then adding this zeroth order term omega uh, to make the whole expression independent of coordinates. So we see for the L2 or S equals zero levi civita connection on the loop space, we get a kind of pointwise differentiation around the loop plus the connection one form is just acting point by point around the loop. And it, it really is just a bundle endomorphism of this, uh, of this uh, tangent space at the loop gamma. Okay, so it's, it's a very simple linear operator on this tangent space. Okay, now I want to go to, for simplicity, I'll set S equal to one. We have this uh, Sobolev one metric and I want to look at its levi civita connection. So let's let our bar be the curvature to G bar. And uh, the next result will look terrible, but uh, we'll just kind of extract the information we need from it. So here's the levi civita connection for the S equals one uh, Riemannian metric. So you can see on the right, the first term is just the L2, uh, L2 levi civita connection, that's pretty simple. And then we have a, a complicated expression. But let's see what it's doing to the element Y. So in the first complicated term on the right-hand side, you can see you're taking covariant derivative of curvature involving Y. So sooner or later, you're gonna be differentiating Y. But in front of this, we have the inverse of one plus Laplacian. And the same thing for all the other terms. Most of them differentiate Y once. So what are we looking at? Well, left-hand side is first the L2 connection, which we said was ordinary differentiation plus a bundle endomorphism. And then the second term, well, one plus Laplacian inverse is pseudo differential operator of order minus two. Then we compose it with differentiating Y once. So we get a pseudo differential operator of order minus one. Uh, a bundle endomorphism is a very simple 
pseudo differential operator. Uh, you can think of it as pseudo differential operator of order zero. So in the end, the uh, the levitch vita connection for the S equals one norm is a differentiation plus a the zeroth order term is now a connection one form, which is a pseudo differential operator of order zero. So the connection one form and hence the curvature two form are zeroth order pseudo differential operators. So pseudo differential operators are showing up naturally. This was first observed uh, in the eighties by Dan Fried in the case of loop groups. So uh, I thought it's worthwhile to spend a few minutes talking about kind of a crash course in pseudo differential operators. So let's start with a pre-compact domain in Rn. Let's use multi-index notation for partial differentiations and for uh, C will be a vector for when you multiply together its components. So a differential operator acting on functions in omega uh, can be written as the sum you see there, a bunch of partial derivatives multiplied by functions up to some order and not. Now, that's very easy to understand. Let's make it complicated to understand. If I take Fourier transformation and Fourier inversion, and uh, I mean, I take DF, take Fourier transformation that will convert all those differentiations to multiplications by these C to the alphas. And then Fourier inversion will, uh, so, so that Fourier transform is the uh, integral over Y and then Fourier inversion gives another integral back over the, uh, the momentum space or cotangent vector uh, C. And now we've replaced the differentiations by multiplication by a polynomial, where we've replaced each partial derivative by the corresponding multiplication operator. And of course, the symbol grows like its uh, highest power, C to the n naught. Uh, pseudo differential operators on omega defined by the same integral. But now we replace the symbol by a, a formal asymptotic sum. We start at c to the n naught, this high power, and work backwards uh, by increasing k in this way. And now here, n naught can be any real number. Yeah, of course, you have to check that uh, these integrals make sense. Okay. So that's a pseudo differential operator acting on functions. We can uh, comment. It, sure. That integral actually doesn't make sense. It does not to, make sense. Well, it never converges, right, in psi. Yeah. So the point is, it's an oscillatory integral. It's not an, a regular integral, not a Lebesgue integral. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Agreed. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, there's no problem doing, uh, extending this to operators that take, uh, say functions, vector value functions to vector value functions, just do it component wise with a little linear algebra thrown in. And then we can carry it over to operators on sections of bundles. Uh, using partition of unity, it's not very pretty. And in this vector valued case, the symbol now becomes a homomorphism on uh, each fiber. Okay. Oh, there. okay. Uh, the operator is called elliptic. If the top order symbol, this homomorphism is invertible for non-zero C. So uh, there are lots of elliptic operators around. Uh, all types of Laplacian or Dirac type operators, Dirac Laplacians are elliptic. Uh, standard Laplacians tend to have symbol, which is C squared times the identity. So that's certainly invertible if C is non zero. Uh, the nice thing is inverses or Green's operators to Laplacians are also elliptic. 
the symbol top order symbol works nicely. I mean, there's a, there's a big theory. And uh, the set of differential operators, of course, forms a graded algebra under composition. It's Z graded. The pseudo differential operators acting on sections of a bundle form a bigger graded algebra that contain all the differential algebras, operators. And now it's R graded. So I have to make another sort of uh, objection. It's a objection. Actually, <laughs> it's, it's actually only filtered. Uh, there's a difference between filtered algebras and graded algebras. So the associated graded is the symbols, whereas, uh, you know, so it's, it's only filtered. You can't make sense of, uh, uh, yeah. So you, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, you just yeah, can't yeah, yeah. For each degree, so. Mm -hmm. and, and these operators like one plus Laplace into the S, uh, there are again pseudo differential operators. Now S can be any real number. Uh, if we want. So, you know, these Green's operators are highly non-local. To compute the Green's operator acting on a function at a point, you need to understand the function everywhere in your domain. But the symbols of these non-local operators are all local. So they're computable in this sense. They're computed point by point in X and C. And we can define the Wodziki residue finally of a pseudo differential operator A on a N manifold acting on sections of bundles over an N manifold to be the following. We take the minus nth order symbol. So that's pretty far down in the symbol sequence. That's a homomorphism on the fibers. We take its trace in each fiber. Now that X and C, so we have to integrate over, well, the unit cosphere bundle. So the, you know, the cosphere variables are the C variables. And this is a trace in the sense that uh, Wozniki residue of AB equals Wozniki residue of BA, even though A and B are typically highly non-commutative. Uh, sorry. Okay, so we're, now we're going to use these this Wozniki residue to build characteristic classes. So let me get uh, a little bit abstract. Maybe it's overkill. So to get uh, if we have a G bundle in for G a finite dimensional Lie group, we want a characteristic class. We need a add G invariant function on the Lie algebra. And then if we have a G bundle, E to M, and we take a connection with curvature omega, if we apply F to powers of omega, we'll get a closed to I form. We, we, this gives us a cohomology class on the base M. And part of the theory is the cohomology class is independent of choice of connection. Well, the most familiar case is when G is unitary group. So we have a uh, Hermitian bundle. And then good choices for F is the trace of A to the I. It's add invariant that just boils down to, in this case, the simple property of trace. And the, the char characteristic classes you get are components of the churn character. This is the case one model. Okay, so now let's go to the loop space and let's take our easy connection. So we know the connection curvature forms takes values in endomorphisms or homomorphisms of the tangent space. That's our Lie, must be our Lie algebra. So the game is to guess the structure group. Well, if the Lie algebra is homomorphisms, the Lie group must be automorphisms. So it's the gauge group. Uh, and that's nice because, as I mentioned, the gauge group is also the structure group of the manifold itself. So this Levi-Civita connection is uh, kind of very well adapted to the manifold structure of the loop, group, loop space. 
But when S is equal to one, we saw that the, these forms take values in pseudo differential operators of order less than or equal to zero. So the game is, if that's your Lie algebra, what's your Lie group? Uh, and it, it turns out the Lie group is invertible zeroth order pseudo differential operators. Its Lie algebra is pseudo differential operators of order less than or equal to zero. Now this structure group contains the gauge group. It's bigger. So we're, ex we're extending the structure group of the tangent bundle to be bigger than its original structure group. We're relaxing the structure group. This, the analog in finite dimensions would be if you had a, a bundle with a Hermitian metric and you had a connection, but the connection doesn't respect the Hermitian structure. I mean, that can happen. Then you, then you have to relax your structure group. Okay, Wodziki residue is a add invariant function on this infinite dimensional Lie algebra for the same reason as in the uh, unitary case example, because it, it's a commuting trace. So now we can define Wodziki churn classes or churn character classes by taking, as in the box, we take a connection on the tangent bundle of the loop space, we take its curvature omega. We take its ith power, take its trace, its Wodziki residue. And because these, uh, we're looking at bundles over the circle, we take in the integral the trace of the minus one symbol. So this is a way of producing uh, cohomology classes on the loop space. Uh, okay, that doesn't work. Uh, these cohomology classes are all zero. Uh, that's because we can compute it for any connection. If we compute it for the L2 connection, well, I mean, the curvature is an endomorphism. It's, it doesn't have a minus one order symbol. So this, this churn character form vanishes pointwise. So that was, uh, that kind of crashes and burns. Uh, on the other hand, because the forms these forms vanish pointwise, we can actually get a Wodziki analog of churn simons forms. So, so let's see how that works. So in finite dimensions, uh, you know, if you have two connections, then character components or churn characters must differ by an exact form. Because, you know, I mentioned that their cohomology class is independent of choice of connection. So they must differ by something exact. And there's an explicit uh, that produces this form CS sub I. Now, if for some reason we can get the left-hand side of that box to vanish pointwise, then the right-hand side is a odd dimensional closed form. So for example, if the connections are flat, so the curvature is zero, or for dimension reasons, the left-hand side is zero then you get uh, a cohomology class in odd degrees. I should have uh, square brackets around CSI in the last line. So, uh, okay, LN is infinite dimensional. You would think, well, we can't use a dimension argument, but because we're computing these classes or these forms using Wodziki residue and it's so local, if the dimension of the manifold is chosen correctly, you can get that left-hand side of the box to vanish. So we can define a Wodziki analog of Chern Simons classes. Okay, and these are finally the odd dimensional cohomology classes we were looking for. And I emphasize it's locally computable. There is a formula to compute it at a loop gamma. You might say it looks pretty horrible, uh, but at least it's computable point by point around the loop. Okay, I, I'm going to speed up a little bit. So uh, let's go back to the case of a high power of a circle bundle. Uh, we've got a symplectic form, as in 
I mean, as, as in gromov witten theory, you can take a compatible, almost complex structure and a Ramanian metric on M. Uh, and then we have this uh, preferred connection on L to the if the metric G to a metric on L to the P. And we can compute the curvature upstairs on L to the P in terms of the curvature downstairs. There's a bunch of formulas. And the, the point is in red, you can see how all these formulas depend on the power P. So this churn simons form has this explicit expression in the curvature. Well, we could plug in the formulas from the lemma. It's of course, it's a terrible mess, but we can keep track of the powers of P. And we'll see that this churn simons form is given by a polynomial in P where the coefficients alpha are forms. So if you recall, we wanted to show that this loop of diffeomorphisms had infinite order in the fundamental group. And we're going to check that out by integrating this churn simons form over this associated uh, fun, well, homology class in the loop space AL. So we take alpha to be this churn simons form. Uh, we want to integrate it over AL or pull it back and integrate it over L to the P. We plug in this polynomial sum for the churn simons form. And we want to know that this expression is non-zero for large powers of P. So in the end, on the right-hand side, we've integrated everything out. We're just looking at a polynomial in P. And we want to know when is this polynomial non-zero for large values of P? And the answer is if any of the coefficients is non-zero, their polynomial will eventually be non-zero. So well, finally, we can finish the proof. We take this churn simons form, write it as a polynomial. Let's look at the highest term. So that's when j is equal to 2k plus 1. When we do this integration, we actually get a non-zero multiple of so-called symplectic volume of the base manifold M. In particular, it's non-zero. So, uh, we finally conclude that pi one of the diffeomorphism group of this L to the P is, uh, has infinite order. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip the remark. Let's give, let me finish with some uh, quick explicit computer calculations. So uh, here's an example, you can find a, a family of so-called Sasaki objects on the five ball. They're parameterized by A between zero and one. And they match up nicely on the boundary of the five ball. Uh, so, you know, any five manifold is given by taking the five ball and doing some gluings on the boundary. In this particular case, you do a gluing to give the five manifold S2 cross S3, and that is a circle bundle over S2 cross S2. And you can do the Steve, we lost zero and one. Oh, sorry, am we I back? We got, we got that silence. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sorry. Critical point. Okay. Yeah, for, for about five seconds. So. Oh, okay. So anyway, there are metrics on the five ball. They glue up nicely on the boundary. When you glue the boundary to get S2 cross S3 as a circle bundle over S2 cross S2, you do this computation. There are no powers of P here just for this particular line bundle. And we get that the integral is given by this explicit expression. It's non-zero if A is non-zero. Sorry, for A between zero and one. So we get that pi one of diffeomorphism group of the five manifold S2 cross S3 is infinite. 
It was definitely a, a new result. And now at A equals one, the metric glues up to a nice metric on the five ball. But look what happens to that expression when A is equal to one, the right hand side is zero. So we get no information about pi one a diffeomorphism group of S5. That case just is, is madding, maddeningly difficult. Uh, in the Kähler case, again, you can do computer calculations for uh, CP2 and this line bundle. Now, we, when we take powers, we see a factor of p squared minus one on the right-hand side. So if p is not equal to one, the right-hand side is non-zero. So as I mentioned, these L to the p's are lens spaces. So we get that pi one of diff of S5 over zp is infinite when p is not equal to one. When p is equal to one, you get pi one of diff S5, no information yet again. And finally, on this example of a symplectic non kähler manifold, you can find explicit metric, you can do computer calculations, you get, uh, I can't do it, but my co-authors can, uh, you get this expression which does not have uh, integer roots. So again, uh, diffeomorphism group has infinite fundamental group for all P. Okay, so uh, let me just sum up to say that, you know, the theory of connections on vector bundles is 70 years old in finite dimensions. When you try to carry it over to infinite dimensions, you end up looking at the category of kind of uh, infinite dimensional vector spaces and linear operators. And that's just much too big a category to make, to, to say much of anything. Uh, in our case, looking at loop spaces, we're fortunate that the category shrinks to uh, pseudo differential operators on Sobolev spaces. And there, there's a good computable theory of characteristic classes that allows us to get uh, results like this. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, for thank you. Talk. Thanks. So, uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, usually they send it by chat, but I don't see any questions on chat. Oh, okay. So, uh, can you just put your hand up and talk. Anyone who wants to ask a question? Yeah.